introductie dicht tegen u doen tegen de mic. Ah, precies. <laughs> Hoe kom ik zo? Ik kan vier minuten. Ik ben geen enkel probleem. Ik ben geen enkel probleem. Ik ben geen enkel probleem. Ik ben geen Hoe lang hebben we in totaal thuis? Een uur, hè? Een uur, ja. Maar nou, de interact zelf duurt duur. 20 minuten of zo. Ja, wel, maar het is voor... nee, Doe maar op het gemak, hè. Wel, dan kunnen we daar, dan kunnen we daar wel meer tijd voor pakken. Het is maar het interessantste gedeelte van... Uh... Ah, dat weet ik eigenlijk niet. Hey, welkom. Um, ik denk de the third DigiTalk um, this year. Um, maybe as an introduction, last week I was in uh, Kenya, uh, together with our minister. And um, Kenya is these days called uh, the Silicon uh, Savannah. And we were there together with some NGOs and, and 40 uh, and more Belgian startups. And although I have been living there, I was there three years ago, I must say um, I was uh, blown away uh, by uh, how much um, Nairobi uh, and the, the tech scene or the innovation scene has changed. Um, this I want to stress that, yes, the context in, where, in which we work has definitely evolved a lot. Often it's uh, around mobile money. In Kenya it's called Mpesa. There has been a, a totally new economy developed and um, where we can learn from uh, these innovations are often called frugal innovations. Uh, the scarcity makes them uh, use these new mobile technologies in a totally different way as we ever could have imagined. And it's going very, very hard. Uh, even last year, I did a DigiTalk uh, mentioning that there were in Africa like 300 something innovation spaces in the whole of Africa. And yesterday we received an e a report, there are 445 tech and innovation spaces in um, Africa. Therefore, I'm very happy to introduce um, Nick from the Board of Innovation. and. Um, For every digital or for most digital projects, a specific methodology is used and it's called human-centered design. So that's why we have invited them because um, you have a lot of experience in that, I believe. Okay. Let's hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, welcome everyone as well. Um, Bert asked me a couple of weeks ago if I could give a short talk on how design thinking or human-centered design might apply to development. Um, I agreed very enthusiastically um, and then he said the talk would be an hour. Um, I prepared a shorter talk because I think it's actually more interesting if we can have a discussion afterwards. So I'm going to tell you two short stories um, focusing on how I've personally done a project in a developing uh, country setting before I was aware of human-centered design and about some of the things that um, went well, some of the things that didn't go as well as I hoped they would go, and how the lessons I've learned since, um, how I would have done it differently. 
And secondly, I want to share a story of one of my colleagues um, who did a project in Malaysia, uh, who really used the methodology and um, the factors that I believe made it a success. Um, and then afterwards, I'm hoping that we can have a discussion because you are the experts on developments. Um, and we have some experience, like Beth mentioned, on design thinking, human-centered design. So that's the program for today. Um, this is supposed to be a world map. Um, and the goal there is to show you that we're going to start our story in South Africa. And we're going back to Antwerp and they will end up in Malaysia. Um, so to start in South Africa, uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to work as a consultant for the International Labour Organization to develop an e-learning uh, module for the Expanded Public Works program. So the Expanded Public Works program, there is a short video which I just skipped, um, is basically a program. It's the biggest public work program uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it's a government program by the government of South Africa and it's focusing on their triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And basically, they're using labor-intensive methods in their public works to create employment, put it very briefly. And they have a challenge, um, being that they really rely on municipal and uh, provincial government officials to apply um, this methodology and to also put the money in. And they have to train these people, so the ILO is helping the government of South Africa with the training efforts. And they decided that they wanted to develop an e-learning platform to scale um, that those training efforts more cost-effectively. That's why they contacted me. I was working on e-learning at the moment, at that time. Um, so I agreed. I was very happy. I went to South Africa. And then um, basically what I did, um, this is, again, a very pixelated picture of my desk with my cat. I had a cat over there. Uh, so I spent the first two months reading a lot of reports, talking to my uh, to, my, to the project team there, and then I created the first draft of those e-learning modules. We then had a full day workshop with, again, yeah, the pictures aren't great, but uh, with the entire project steering team, which consisted of people from the International Labour Organization and people from the uh, National Department of Public Works. They read things, they approved on some things, they disapproved of others. Um, and basically, they gave us the go-ahead to develop it. So we spent the next two months to develop um, those modules, put them online. Again, mainly spent them um, in my office with the little cat over there, um, coding away, creating these e-learning modules. And in the end, we had a nice workshop. This is Yama on the right, my, uh, my supervisor there, a really nice guy. We had a whole workshop on how they could actually use the platform. Uh, and then I went home. Uh, so I came back to Antwerp. I have a question for you. Is there anything from your experience which is missing in the story? This is a very short overview of the project. Are you missing anything? Yeah, exactly. The users of e-learning, I think that's the most apparent. Uh, we did test it out, but we tested it out a week before we launched it. And yeah, on hindsight, knowing what I know now, and that's the worst thing to do actually, um, which is where the story brings me next. Uh, I went back to Antwerp and I got a job at Board of Innovation. Um, we are an international innovation consultancy. Um, we mainly work for corporates, but I will tell you a bit more about that later. This is a picture of my, I think my first week. We had a, our version of a digital, it's called Amaze Me. I'm right there behind the horse. Um, and I was amazed by yeah, the very nice people who were working there, but also about the methodologies that we were using. Um, so since what I've been doing for the last year or so is working with a lot of large organizations, so mainly corporates, um, on developing their innovation strategy and also in implementing it. So it means setting up a startup for a corporate, um, running global acceleration programs where you have internal startups or external startups working together with corporates and really guiding them through this journey. Um, and so as a company, that's what we do. We help corporates innovate like startups and we use design thinking as our main methodology there. So again, and we do it internationally. Um, and that's also important, I think, in, the terms, in this perspective, is that you learn a lot from working, from people, working with people from a different background. So we're 25, we are 11 nationalities as of last week, I think. Um, and I will share one of the stories of my colleague from Malaysia with you later who really, yeah, where you can really see that having that local knowledge is uh, so important. So when I was working there, I learned about 
uh, design thinking. And design thinking is basically a human-centered methodology on problem solving. Um, I'm going to run you through it in a bit. Um, but what's very important there is indeed empathizing with your end user. And that's what, if I'm looking back now at how I handled that project in South Africa, I'm, yeah, I'm not ashamed because failing is part of the journey. But I really wish I had a chance to do it over because there is a lot of opportunities to do it better. Um, what I'm going to share with you now is a story by one of my colleagues. He was, uh, they were hired by the Malaysian uh, Ministry of Education with a very clear and simple mission. Um, again, the world map. They were asked how they could improve the English literacy of children living in rural co uh, communities in northern Malaysia. Um, so they had a week for this project, which seems very short. They had a week and a dedicated team of three people. Um, so they took a car and they drove to the north, to the town of Kelatan, and then to a little village uh, an hour to the west of it. And they spent the first two days empathizing. So that's the first phase in design thinking. You em try to empathize with your end users. So they spent two days, basically, uh, they followed some classes in the local school. They talked to the teachers. They talked to the tutors. They talked a lot to the students, uh, which were primary school students. So they basically spent two days playing around with the students. And only after those two days, they set aside half a day to, um, as a team, try to define what are the insights that they got from all this empathy. Um, this is a very classic mistake. I'm not sure if you have done it yourself, but if you interview people um, and you, you hear one thing and you already start thinking about, ah, oh, that fits in my mental framework or that's, uh, that's validating the assumption I had about the problem. And then while you're doing it, you're actually missing the other 90% of the conversation. So here in design thinking, it's very important that you actually really focus on empathy alone and that you take define as a separate step. So they spent half a day defining, gathering all the insights, um, using a lot of post-its, and in the end they come up with two very simple insights actually. They said if this solution, which we are about to start thinking about, uh, if it has to be successful, it has to be two things. It has to be free. Um, because what they saw was that the quality of the teachers teaching English in the public school system was pretty poor. Uh, there were private tutors available, but those families of those children didn't, simply didn't have the money to pay for them. And secondly, it had to be engaging because all the kids they talked to very clearly indicated they didn't feel like doing anything like school after school. Um, so those were the two, they were two, the two main aspects in their design brief. Then they spent the second half of, the, uh, of that third day on ideating, so they came up with a lot of crazy wild ideas. Um, again, using it's kind of the it's part of the process, but they used a lot of posters again. And one of the ideas which they came up with was using objects that children like to play with, uh, objects that they yeah, that they are drawn to, <laughs> and labeling them in different uh, in different languages, so in Malay and in English. And then the idea was that the children would actually teach themselves um, by playing with those objects. So the fourth phase. Um, in design thinking is prototyping. So on the fourth day, they went around, they looked up a BMW car dealership in the closest town. Because apparently um, in Malaysia, BMWs are like the status symbol. Maybe not really in Belgium, but over there they are. Uh, and they convinced the shop owner to borrow them a BMW for a day. So they drove the BMW um, back to the village. And in the meantime, they stopped and they basically taped um, they taped on the door, they taped a pinto and then door. So they taped the entire um, car in two languages. And then they invited the children to play with it. And they also added, yeah, so they experimented a bit with the setup, add a teacher, um, add one of their stuff and see how the children interacted with it. And the results were pretty encouraging. Um, children were playing with it even after school time. And then while they were doing that, so this is actually the second, the last phase, that's the testing. So they were testing their prototype, which they made in a, about a day. And while they were doing it, they could notice that there were a lot of parents who were coming or just walking around in the village, basically, who came to see what was going on. And they weren't looking very happy. They were actually looking rather angry at this whole uh, scene going on. So yeah, they went to talk to those parents, uh, asked them, why they, how they felt about this project. And 
the surprising thing that the parents said was like, I don't want my children to be learning English. If they have the time to learn English, then they also have the time to learn Arabic. Because uh, in that village they're uh, Islamic, and their view of uh, poverty was if you learn Arabic, then you will be a better Muslim, and in the Quran it's written that God will provide for you. Um, so basically, right there, they were stopped in their tracks because they realized if we are going to expand this program and label other things than cars, it's never going to work because children won't be allowed by their parents to actually play with those things because they will be encouraged. To, they have to go and learn Arabic or do other stuff. Um, so yeah, the week was over. They went back uh, to their office. They, and then they rescheduled a two-day visit for a couple of weeks later. And they took those new insights. And that's the important part about design thinking. A lot of people think this is a process which takes a couple of weeks or a couple of months where you really try to understand very deeply the local customs or the problem behind it. Um, that's a possibility. But you can also do this in, you can literally do this whole process in one day. They did it in a week. And then you go back and you start all over. So it's a very iterative process. It's actually a loop. So they took those new insights that um, the parents gave them and they set up, after a couple of iterations, they came up with a program where they translated um, attractive stories from the Quran in English and they set up a pilot where they taught the children um, with collaboration of the local uh, imam, they taught the children in the mosque to yeah, those little stories in English because the message there was if the children will learn English will learn the Quran in English, they will be able to spread the faith to uh, the non-believers. And so they, that's the way they got the approval of the yeah, locally. Which, um, yeah, it's just one story, of course. But I think if you look at the entire process of human-centered design, and I'm going through it rather quickly now, I think we can have a discussion about it afterwards. Um, for me, at least, the most powerful part of it is that you emphasize, you try to emphasize and you put your assumptions you have about the problem to the side, and then you quickly jump into um, having an ID, prototyping it very quickly. In half a day, you can prototype in one hour by just sketching out your solution and then showing it or try having your end users interact with it, gaining lessons and doing it all over again uh, in a very fast, um, iterative loop. So this is a very short introduction to design thinking. Now, why are we standing here? Um, or why do we think that human-centered design, and this is a methodology we apply with success in some of the world's largest corporations developing new services, new products. Why do I think that it's, uh, from my very limited background in development, why do I think it's actually a methodology which can be used and which is actually already being used by a lot of multilateral aid organizations, but should be used even more. I think there are three main aspects. It's human-centered by design, so you're really designing for the users, which is the goal of well, what everybody in this room is doing. Uh, there is a lot of power in the fast iteration. And thirdly, uh, important as well, is that the whole process is actually very, yeah, it's almost designed for co-creation. So you are involving your users in actually co-designing and co-creation, co-creating the solutions that you are developing for them. And especially in a con context which is completely foreign or alien to ours, that's very powerful because you can, you can go into a rural community in uh, the east of Congo near Kisangani. You will have to spend a lot of time and effort to actually understand local customs and you probably won't get it. Or you might get it if you live there for a while, but if you just go in for a short period for a typical project, yeah, then it's rather, it's difficult to come up with solutions that are really adaptable to those needs. If you involve the, your end users in co-creating, and I know from my discussions with Beth that you are already doing that, uh, then you can come up with solutions that are actually being used and that are successful in the end. Um, does it mean that you have to involve people in the entire process? No, it depends on, yeah, it really depends on the kind of process. Sometimes you really interact with people during empathizing and during testing only. But I've also, we've also done projects where we really involve, um, and that's in a corporate setting where we involve clients, uh, B2B or B2C, in the entire process of creating a new service or new product. Um, 
this is my final or final slides. Um, we are a for-profit company. We are working mainly for corporates. Uh, we have done um, some work um, in the social sector. Uh, we have worked, and this is again my famous world map by now. Uh, we've done some projects in, uh, in Belgium. We've worked for a local NGO in Antwerp working on generational poverty, Ermete Kort. Um, we've worked for, you know, for other consultancy agencies like Geneva Global who are working uh, mainly in the development sector. And we, last year we did four design sprints. A design sprint is a one week program where you basically run through the design thinking um, process in one week. We run four uh, one week design sprints in um, Myanmar together with PayPal. PayPal is an NGO which brings together corporates and local grassroots NGOs. And there we were working with uh, local grassroots NGOs mainly on uh, reproductive and sexual health. Um, so we helped one of them to, yeah, their funding was drying out, so to use business model innovation to come up with new, uh, more sustainable revenue streams. Uh, another NGO, we, together with them, we designed a new solution to, uh, to reach out to their key targets, which were, if I remember it correctly, I wasn't there at the time, uh, which were prostitutes and make sure that they actually use uh, contraceptives. Uh, and then just by, because of course the people of these NGOs are the experts, but by giving them the framework and by allowing them to prototype very fast and testing it with their users, we were able to get some traction and get some results done on a very relative, very short period of time. So these are projects which we have done and which we are doing at the moment. Um, but recently, uh, Philippe, who is uh, one of our co-founders and a couple of other people in the team, including me, we decided we want to do this at a more structural, a more sustainable level, which is why we um, founded uh, boardofinnovation.org. That's our non-profit arm, uh, where the goal is really to work, to bring innovation to those people who need it most. Um, and we, yeah, all right, that's, that's it. Uh, <laughs> here we are. So I think, yeah, or some, maybe to end off with, um, so I think we believe in a future where people are positive, um, creating, uh, creative, and we're actually, most importantly, I think they are empowered to create the solutions um, they need for themselves. Um, and I'm now actually really looking forward to hearing your feedback on this, how you've experienced uh, this, what you could see as pitfalls or any questions you have about uh, human-centered design or design thinking in general. Yeah, sure. I can say some, uh, comment something. I mean, it looks, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It looks very interesting. And also, I mean, the way you've explained the design thinking um, looks quite logical in, in its different yeah. steps. But, um, I mean, one important aspect, as you've said yourself, is that, uh, like, the empathy that you need with your target group, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, but isn't then the, like, much more key question, how do you empathize? I mean, I see actually no. there, I see a big, much bigger problem than going through the different steps. Because, I mean, this is, this is the, you need a certain attitude or you need a certain mindset to be able to do that. And especially if you're talking about um, going to other countries, uh, go, talking to no. people from cultures that you don't know that <coughs> It's a very, very good remark, and it's also one of the hardest parts if we talk about how we do this in our day-to-day. -day. Um, if we are working with uh, large corporations and you want to get those people to go out and to actually go talk to their um, users, do uh, interviews with them, um, do uh, ethnographic research by actually observing them how they are, that's a very challenging uh, thing to do because a lot of people are, that's really drawing people out of their comfort zone. Uh, if you're talking about applying this in development, it's, yeah, it's that times 10. Um, but there are a lot of tools to do this in a structural way and those tools are backed up by, and there's a lot of science about this as well, of course. Um, so to answer your question, we, yeah, we generally, we have a, a, a huge toolbox and we just decide on the moment, all right, what's, most relevant for this specific challenge at hand. Um, okay, do you know how it was done in the, like the example you gave in Malaysia? Do you know how it was done there? How they, how they actually did it? Um, yeah, no, I don't. Step, yeah. 
Um, I, I have some, I have some clues, but I, I wouldn't be able to give you a very concrete answer. I know they used observation, so they just observed kids for a while. It was a local team, so they spoke the language. It made it easier to interact in a more yeah, natural manner than if you actually have to use a translator to do your things. Um, and then yeah, I know they also did interviews, so problem interviews, where you really try to ask people like why. So if you go to a teacher mainly, because it's easier to do it with adults. Um, why you, know, you basically you tell people why they are why they did something and you ask them about stories rather than opinions that's one of the first things we try to um, tell our our clients um, you want to ask you if you want to get to the bottom of why people are doing something then ask them about the last time they did something and explain why they did it and you, yeah well, I'm sure you've done it before but that's uh but I'm not sure about this case specifically how it was done I wasn't there unfortunately Mm-hmm. You mentioned yourself, it's, it's very important to be as precise, but also to be aware of the biases you may have. So how do you deal with it as a, as a consultant? And then the second is when you go to a prototype. So if you live in, in a confined setting like the village in Malaysia, if you would do that now countrywide or, or, or system-wide, how would you do that? Um, to answer, something yeah. In, in, a, in a very precise context, and yeah, if you would have to upscale that, yeah, how, how would you do that? Mm, all right, very interesting questions. Uh, to go to the first one, um, I think the key is what you said is being aware of your own biases. Um, that's the first, yeah, sort of introspective exercise you might, uh, or you, we, well, at least I try to do regularly. Then it's really by, yeah, uh, it sounds cliche, but just listening to people and asking them, and also very practically. Um, <coughs> We try to go with always with teams of at least two, uh, and then ideally people who have a very different backgrounds. So for me personally, for example, I'm much more um, yeah, specialized, or I work a lot more on the second part of the program, of the thing where you actually go about I from ideation to testing, because I'm not as experienced, or yeah, I have a mental thing where I tend to jump to conclusions instead of actually really trying to solve the problem, um, which is something I'm working on. Uh, so yeah, you try to get different profiles and uh, people from different backgrounds in there, and then you just really facilitate the discussion. Um, and also, it's important to understand that you can't get it 100% right, or you can't even get it 50% right the first time. You just you do your best, you get some uh, insights, you prototype, you test them, and then you just really have to be open to failure. A lot of people get falling in love with the first thing they come up with, and they think this is a great solution. Like, I really like this car with the languages and then those parents, they can, yeah. we shouldn't pay too much attention to them. It would be easy to just ignore it, to turn a blind eye. And I think that's probably the most important um, f skill you need is to yeah, be open-minded enough to realize that you're going to be wrong 90% of the time and that it's all right to fail as long as you fail quickly and cheaply instead of. And that brings us to the second part, I think. Um, I would say always test uh, on a small scale first, and if you want to test something on a larger scale, try to do it as cheaply as possible and as fast as possible. So I would never suggest you rolling out a program country um with a lot of resources and effort behind it if you aren't very sure that it's actually going to, if you haven't rolled it out locally or if you haven't rolled a very flawed version of it, which you can, you know, I've created websites for uh, corporates in half an hour, uh, put them online where there's like 10 spelling mistakes in it just to get feedback from 10 people and then based upon that feedback I'm actually much like the second version is a lot better than if I would have spent a full day working on it and just going through that process very iteratively is powerful I would think. Any other questions? or? So this approach applies to the production development of the software, right? No, uh, it, it uh, could, so yeah. Um, also on uh, new services, on new products which are physical, uh, on designing a new organizational structure. It's really a, pro it's a process which you can apply best in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty. 
because it's really geared towards being iterative and trying to understand the problem. So if example, you our organization has been thinking about two years about restructuring. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if we had applied your method, your approach, we could have done it in maybe two weeks or three weeks. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think you could have, so if you talk about organizational redesign, um, well, we just had one actually uh, internally because we grew pretty fast. It's a miniature version of Enable, of course. Uh, and then interesting there is you, yeah, you talk to three or four people, you come up with some ideas, you sketch it, like a prototype can be a sketch of a new organizational structure, which you then go check with people who are directly involved, you ask for their advice. You make it very clear that nothing is final yet, and you do it again and again um, until all your assumptions, the assumptions you have about why your solution would be good. So if you come up with a solution of, say, say a new organization designed for Enable, uh, you will have some assumption about it, I'm sure, or you could think of some critical assumptions. Then try to com make your prototypes um, to actually go test those assumptions. So a prototype, yeah, a prototype as we define it, is a tool to test an assumption. So if your assumption is uh, for your organization or for your organizational redesign that uh, things work better if um, decision-making power is decentralized, all right, try to come up with a prototype, which can be an experiment, say, let one team decentral decentralize the decision-making process in one team and see how that goes, color their feedback. Um, that's just one example, but yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Or I fail to understand the, the, what, what is special about your approach compared to other approaches. If you go to, I mean, the Project Management Institute, they have a certification in business analysis, and they have an eight-step approach that will describe you how you come to understand the needs of the end yeah. user and come to a proper design, and then you have agile things, etc. There's so many. There's a lot of. There's so many. I mean, is it not an additional buzzword? Just uh, some marketing just to sell your business, and it's the right one. But in the end, I mean, the example you gave, I mm -hmm. think, has a strong weakness. You discover at the end that you should have empathized with the parents in the first step. Yeah. So my first reaction is, wow, we didn't do a stakeholder analysis and see who are the people you should empathize with. Because obviously, if you want to develop a project for children, the children are not the decision makers. Mm -hmm. There are an important yeah. element, but it's by no means no, I get by discussing with these people that you will get yeah. something. So if you had started with the parents, you would have learned it I, much quicker. I agree. So but I think and um, <coughs> it's well there are a couple of uh, aspects to your argument. I would say it is another approach and there are a lot. You have agile, you have lean startup, you have uh, well there is you could fill a book with all the different uh, approaches. And, uh, well, this is one which is tried and tested, so we believe that it actually works. Why? And I think the power in it is basically that you allow yourself uh, to fail. So you could, in this example, you could indeed have they made a stakeholder analysis, interviewed all the different stakeholders, and if you do it broadly enough, you would spend a week or two interviewing people, because you will have the parents, but you'll also have the, uh, the local government. You pr maybe you even forget the children. I, you probably wouldn't, but the key here is that you do it iteratively and you set yourself up to fail because you learn more from those failures. You, you do, so basically you do it, you realize afterwards, ah, oh, we should have consulted the parents. And immediately by showing them something, you provoke a reaction from them, which will tell you something that maybe they wouldn't have told you if you interviewed them in the first place. Or if you go talk to them, you ask, would your children, would you like your children to learn English? They would say, probably say, ah, oh, yes. Because it's not a. It's only when you, they see it being done that then you get those, that reaction out. That's an assumption, of course. Maybe simplifying things a bit. Um, but yeah, and then the third part of is this an approach to, well, maybe to make it very clear. We're not here to sell any business. This is a, um, yeah. This is more. This is a non-profit uh, thing for us. Um, so is it an approach? where you convince your clients that this is the new buzzword, I would say no, because you just because you actually set it up in like, we're gonna do this in three days with you, and then you get to decide if it's a success or if you've learned important lessons. If you haven't, 
then you have tried an experiment for three days, it has failed, and you move on using the established approaches you had in place for the last five or ten years. Does that end? So the, sh the, the short period is really uh, uh, characteristic of, a, of your approach. No. You speak about mm -hmm. days, five days. I mean, that's really <laughs> one part of your... Uh, and the, the succession of uh, we yeah we do we do pro we do process we do projects which last a year or longer, but if you boil them down, then there's always a loop happening. How long the loop is depends on the kind of projects you are doing, uh, you know, the involvement of all stakeholders and so forth. But yeah, the shortness or the well, the iterative thing is a key aspect to the whole methodology. It's, I mean, I, I think it's, it's definitely it's definitely a risk and it's a problem you would encounter and then our counter argument would be or the way we explain it is you aren't failing you are going through a fast cycle of validated learning you're actually learning very quickly because you try things out uh, end goal of course is a successful product if you would go through 10 of these projects and none of them would have any positive impact or positive results in the end yeah then that's a different story but I think short failures to have a uh, long-term success are, you know, are actually a good thing. And I can actually, in the, in the Malaysia example, I can also imagine that if they would have started talking to parents first, that then at the uh, end they would have found out that they forgot to talk to the children. I mean, I don't know if, like, for me, this sounds actually quite classical mistake to only talk to the parents because you assume that they have all the, the decisive power but the, since the children are, those are the ones that have to learn so I think it makes a lot of sense to also talk to them to see what they what they think they need or what where they uh, what they react to of course yeah but so I mean in that sense it's not it's not a way to, yeah but you did you I mean you did say uh, um I mean, uh, you, you presented it as being a lot of wasted time, and I don't think... I mean, but that's the matter of, I mean, when we work in Europe and we try to make a stakeholder analysis, and we try to talk with all the stakeholders at the same time. And is it a mistake? Should we talk to one stakeholder, develop something, and then see the reaction of all the other stakeholders, then include the second stakeholder, do a second step, and then include the third stakeholder, the third step, and so incremental learning by including mm -hmm. progressive stakeholders. But then you need to re-include <laughs> the stakeholders from the first time because the change in the fourth step will uh -huh. impact them. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have all stakeholders involved from the beginning to the end rather than separating stakeholders and getting them to be exposed as, as we test. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure in the end we are not going to generate yeah. a lot of frustration among the various groups that we say, why didn't they talk to us in the beginning? I think for, so, maybe for clarity know. purposes, it's not, I wouldn't suggest that you only speak to one stakeholder and then you go develop something. Uh, and we, like, we actually do use stakeholder mapping. It's, part, it's one of the exercises we do if we feel that it's necessary. I think the difference is we apply the 80-20% rule to everything. We, we don't do a full stakeholder analysis, spend a lot of time on it. We do it in half an hour and we kind of map out the obvious people to go talk to or the non-obvious with the people who are actually there. We ask them, so who do you think are the main stakeholders and why? Ask it to three people and you get a nice list. And then you say, all right, let's go talk to those three or four, maybe because they're available. Um, it's If they are available the same day and another <coughs> important stakeholder, you won't be able to make an appointment in the next week or two weeks. Then I would always say, uh, forget about him for a second. We'll go with what we have right now. We'll develop something, and then we'll involve him later on. And if necessary, changes. I do think that there, and I'm, yeah, I think there, uh, you have a lot more expertise. I would be very careful with uh, trying to yeah, make something which, where you create ill will or um, ill will with local communities. Because you are, if you are designing products or services for, especially for uh, the poor, I think the feedback you get is firstly very honest, um, but it, it would also, it would definitely be a risk that you lose your credibility early on in the process. 
So I agree with you there that it's something uh, that you should definitely take into account when you design your approach. Because you, this is an approach, this is a framework. You basically design it every time you start all over. You say, all right, these are the tools we can use for this program. Uh, that's the output we want for each step of the, of the, of the whole journey. So it's more of a framework and a, mental, and a yeah, thinking method than it is a very fixed way of working. And first step, do those three things. Second step, do, do, do these things. Um, yeah. I think if I'm a country and I hire you as a specialist, I would not appreciate that you do several circles and then noticing that you do something and you didn't do it all again. I want you to be efficient and I want valuable money. I think, in my, in my view, the best way to tackle that problem is twofold. It's like any IT project, for instance, that we do. Mm -hmm. You have your customer, he's asking you something, you come up with a proposal, and you have to ask him to sign off that, okay, did I understand this well? This is what I'm going to do, and that's the result we're heading for, and you get an agreement from the start. So that at least you have an agreement with the guy who's paying you. And then secondly, uh, I would go for co-creation from the start and through the whole chain. I was a bit surprised in your presentation that you said, well, co-creation, you can do it if you want or not. I think if you believe in the empathy, which is the first part which seems to be important, and I agree with that, it's very important, then the logic would be that you take them on board from the beginning through the whole journey and do together co-creation. And then you will either avoid these kind of mm -hmm. mistakes or at least tackle them much earlier uh, right. in, in I the would process. Maybe for the second part, your second uh, suggestion first, I, I agree that it's very powerful to um, use co-creation throughout the entire setting. Sometimes though, um, imagine you're you end up ideating and you come up with a solution which is more high tech. Um, how do you involve people who don't necessarily have that technical capability? So that's why we say it depends on the project. Sometimes you leave them out of the ideation and prototyping phase. You have the famous fake quote from uh, Fort. If I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Uh, it's, it's, they didn't actually say that, by the way, but I think that's, yeah, there it really depends on what you are designing. Ideally, uh, I would say go for co-creation throughout the journey. Um, then um, on your first remark, um, I think, especially if you're talking about IT projects, there are other methodologies like Agile, which are more suitable. Uh, design thinking works best, like I said, in things where there is high uncertainty. So we, of course, if we sign a contract or if we work with a client, we generally, yeah, we agree on clear goals in the end and KPIs. And we explain to him in advance or her that, all right, look, this is a process where we're going to go through. We will do a couple of loops, um, expect this failure in the end. That's what you do with your, with the client or the person who's hiring you not necessarily with the people who will be the end users or the customers because with them you kind of you involve them in the creative process um so in in a, in a sense it's a very yeah, it's a creative exercise you're doing with those people i think that solves you any other questions or suggestions or but design thinking is an approach that you invented or is it something no. that exists and that with a methodology and it's a Book, uh, there are there are a l there's a lot written about it. It's invented. Uh, it's in yeah. We attributed it to Ideo uh, and Stanford. So it's at Stanford in the U.S. Uh, that it was or that it is invented. Um, and yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of literature on it. Um, there is also, which I noticed recently when I was researching, the link between development and human-centered design or design thinking. It's an approach which is being used by more and more um, organizations. Uh, UNICEF is focusing it in particular pretty heavily. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's not something new. It's been around for a while, um, and it's one of the two methodologies that we use in our day-to-day -day work. Um, yeah, as a framework, basically to get our work done for our clients. We have some some books in our DO library. And I think the uh, IDO course is uh, for free. Yeah? Ah, yeah, there's it's, uh, it's online. Uh, 
Um, we started it, but we haven't finished it, to be honest. Um, so but there's a lot of material to be found. Yeah, there's a great online course, indeed, for free. Uh, it's called Human Centered Design. Um, that takes you through the... It's a project-based course which takes five weeks and two hours a week, I think. Um, and it really takes you through it and gives you some extra readings and videos. So I would highly recommend it. I know you started. <coughs> right. Then... <coughs> no more questions? Then I think we can... Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for... Uh, your feedback and being here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.